Welcome to the Island Park Fitness Podcast. Today, I'm with Kareen and Lori. Both been longtime members, so we're just going to find out a little about you. Where did you guys, uh, where did you... Where did I grow up? Yeah, were you born in New York? I was born in New York. I grew up in Maspeth, Queens. Uh, I lived there till I was 20 when we got married, Frank okay. and I. Moved out here to Oceanside. Um... Yeah, I don't know, like, uh, you want to know what else, like how we, we'll uh, get to it. did. Uh, yeah. Karen, were you born in New York? Yeah. Yes, uh, I was born in Rockland County. I lived there until I was 25, and then I lived in the city until my son was born, and uh, we've been living in Lindbrook for almost 18 years. We moved here when he was a couple months old. Nice. Wow, yeah. What were the households like? Did you grow up with siblings? I have uh, two younger sisters. Okay. My mom, my parents were divorced. Okay. Yeah. So we lived in an apartment. Had a lot of fun. You are which of the siblings? I'm the oldest. The oldest. I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest too. Are you? (laughs) Of how many? Uh, Well, two. uh, I have a sister and a brother with my mom and my dad, and then I have two half sisters with my dad and my stepmother. But we're all very close, so it's like there's five of us. Oh, and you're the oldest. (laughs) I'm the oldest. Yeah, funny. Yeah. Uh, Do you play any sports growing up, Lori? Um, Well, living in Queens. You know, you played sports every day outside in the street Shot with your rope friends. And stick yeah, ball. we played stickball. We would play handball. We played wiffle ball. We played softball. There was an empty lot across the street from my house, so we would play softball there. I lived around the corner from a dead end, so that's where we would go and play wiffle ball. Oh, perfect. Um, everything. I mean, we, there would be about no exaggeration, probably about thirty of us, all the time, day, night. All different ages. Oh, that's awesome! Hanging out there and playing stuff. We even played. We would play two hand touch football. Okay. We made up our own game called slap ball. So instead of us playing with baseball, wiffle ball, you had to hit the ball with your hand, and okay. then run the bases. Do it like that. We used to play. I so mean, you have to do a dead hang after that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had a basketball hoop on the you know on the telephone pole. It was a uh, um, it wasn't even a hoop. Somebody just put up there a broken milk case. <laughs> we weren't poor, but that's what they did. You know, like we were, you know, they just put it up there, like, hey, listen, we got this. Let's just cut it out and put it up there. We were like, all right, let's do it. That's awesome. Yeah. Any organized sports? Uh, I played softball. I did play softball for a couple of years. Okay. Um, I played, um, I was young when I played that, like maybe about 11, 10, 11. I liked being outside playing more with my yeah. friends. Not, yeah. And Karen? Um, yeah, well, there, there were woods on three sides of my house, and mm. behind my house there was a dirt bike trail that some of the older kids had built. There was also a really cool sleigh riding hill uh, called Dead Man's Hill. The whole neighborhood would come through there. I rode my bike everywhere when I was a kid. Just like Lori said, we would have like softball games and a basketball hoop in the neighborhood with the other kids, but I didn't, I didn't play any organized sports ever in school. I went to a gym starting in high school, and I, I started running in high school, but I didn't do any, anything due to school. Okay. What was like the uh, gym routine? Um, it was mostly machines. I didn't really know anything about mm. how to work out. I would run on the treadmill, or I think it was even, I, I think the elliptical machine was like invented or something. Right, right. The gym at some point <laughs> when I was like in, in yeah. high school or college or law school, mostly I'd run on the treadmill, ride the bike, and, and do the machines. Like I didn't really learn how to work out until I was much older. I mean, it did something right. for you me. Did something. Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, it was what you thought you could do back then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so was it just health look better? Those were like goals? Yeah, I, and, yeah. I, and I liked it. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it if I didn't enjoy it. Right. <laughs> cool. Yeah, same. I was always doing something. Yeah. Like, always something. A lot of energy. When, I feel, that's what I feel like. When you were younger, like, where I, I don't know if it's just where you grew up or just, you know, what. You were always outside. You went outside. You didn't come home until you were supposed to come home. So you were always doing something. Right. You were with all the kids in the neighborhood. You, you, knew, the the neighborhood. Neighborhood. you knew your neighborhood. I don't Nobody know Nobody was now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody, no. there weren't, you know, no one was really played any organized sports grow, when I was growing up until they got to high school. Okay. Yeah. You know, because then you played high school ball or whatever, you, you know. I think my brother did Little League, and then we would hang out at the field. Yeah, and, you know. See which guys were cute. So you were always, and... always moving, always <laughs> moving. I used to, even when, and then when I had the kids, I remember I used to put, I would put, I'd have one ride on a bicycle, and I would put my son in a stroller. I don't know if they had jogging strollers then, but I used to have a stroller with so many kind of decent-sized wheels, and I would just push him and rollerblade around the park. I would be on rollerblades, he'd be nice. in a stroller, she'd be on a bike. <laughs> So it was always something. Yeah, yeah, I would take them for walks in the double stroller, yeah. and it wasn't a jogging stroller. I should have gotten a jogging stroller. My sister had yeah. one that was nice. I don't know why I never got one. I walked them on the boardwalk mm-hmm. around the neighborhood. My kids, yeah, when they were babies. So was there ever any like, I'm going to the gym to do fitness? Like when did that start? That started 
when I had Dean, actually. So Dean was born in 1992. So after that, I was like, all right, I'm going to start and go to the gym. I'd go to the gym. He didn't like daycare, so he was always crying. But anyway, so I did it I did it then. And then I really started to do it more when Taylor was born. She okay. liked daycare, so I stuck her in there, and I would go to the gym. you know. And then I did a personal trainer. And we used to do, like, mock gym competitions. What, tell me more. Yeah, we used it's to do mock gym. So we had to write down what we were eating. And, and it was just a few of us that did it, like my trainer and another trainer and myself and one other girl. And it was just a goof thing, but it was just a good way to kind of keep you going. So they ha I had a book before the internet had everything. Yeah. And it showed you everything that you ate, like, you know, and ha ha the portion, the calories, the fat, the this, that, the other thing. Nice. So we would do that. And then we also worked out. And then at the end, we would see how much muscle we gained. We weren't like, doing competition and posing or anything okay, okay we would see how much muscle that we gained and how much fat we lost and um it was, it was pretty cool it was pretty fun to do that and then that was just it then i just was always just started to do stuff you know and then once started with jetty yeah you know that was a whole different backstory for that that was like your first that was my intensity first high intensity CrossFit yeah crossfit style okay and i don't even know if i probably would have started that if it wasn't you know for the fact of I knew who was going to open it. Okay. And um, kept saying, I got something coming. We got something coming. And then that's how that started. Cool. Yeah. Corinne, when was your first, like, high-intensity CrossFit-style training? So I had gone to, like, Gold's Gym, I guess, when I was living in Rockland. And then when I lived in the city, I went to New York Sports Club. And then when we moved out here, Michael was a baby. And then I really didn't have a gym membership. I had, like, an elliptical machine machines some weights in my house. And then when Shannon was eight months old, one of my husband's friends, Karen, you know, because he's from here, so, you know, his friends that he grew up with are still living here, said to me, oh, we can go join this gym, Sky Athletic Club. They have a daycare. That's where I went. Yeah, they have a daycare <laughs> for the kids. So then that was it. I was there two hours a day. Yeah. I was doing the – I didn't like most of the aerobic type classes. I liked, like, the yoga classes, and I liked to run on the treadmill and do mm -hmm. the weights. And that's when I started working out with a trainer and learning how to use free weights and everything. Mm -hmm. That's and then what, what I started with Yeah, the what really turned stories. Me, like, and, as far as CrossFit, so my kids um, go to Shaolin Self-Defense Karate, you know, so, well, Shannon doesn't anymore, Michael doesn't really go that much anymore, but he started there when he was six, and he's 17 now, so a while ago, and then Brad, the owner of that, he went and got his CrossFit coach license, and in May of 2014, he's like, oh, I'm giving all the moms a free month of CrossFit for, uh, for Mother's Day, wow. so my friend Josephine's like, we should do this, and I swear to God, this is what I said, I was like... I can't get up to get there at five in the morning. <laughs> yeah, see? Famous last word. Yeah. I've been working out at five in the morning yeah. ever since then. And in fact, I'm always saying to Rob, oh, this class should start at five instead of 530. Who wants to kill me? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, but yeah, so then that was like famous last word. So that's when I started using a barbell and learning like CrossFit type of stuff. And then he eventually couldn't really sustain the 5 a.m. thing, Brad, because he had karate classes for the kids at night. It was just too long right. of a day for him. Then my friend Allison and I were briefly at CrossFit Seize the Day, and then she actually mm. found this place. I had blown out one of my shoulders, and she's like, they have chiropractors there. You know, you can go to them for your shoulder, and she's like, we should try that gym. So we joined here together in January of 2017. Nice. And then she ended up not really being able to say she's, she's a high school teacher. She has to be at work at like 645, so it was just too hard for her uh, timing-wise. But she's the one that got me here. Her, her mm. husband goes here now, her husband Mark, so. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so I've been here that's ever so since. We so probably like cross paths yeah. in Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we did. We I'm sure we did. Definitely yeah, did. We probably it's know crazy. some of the same people it's that probably. went there. You know, like yeah. Renee Gorham, Melissa Almodovar, any of those people? No. Okay. Those people I don't. Those are the people I'm still I, in I touch with been, from Sky. Okay. <laughs> I might I might have been probably before you because yeah. my youngest daughter is 20. Okay. So, yeah, mine are 17 and 15. Yeah, so, so it was definitely yeah. before. Yeah. But it was good to have that gym with the daycare. It was. It and was the kids great. made friends in there. Like the two women I just mentioned, like our kids are friends, we're uh -huh. friends, our, you know, the husbands are friends, we all hang out together. That's it was really great. So, and I met them at that gym. Okay. That's cool. For, for somebody moving somewhere that I didn't grow up, you know, I, I have a lot of friends here, mostly right. from this gym and some of them from that gym. Right. <laughs> True. What was diet like growing up, Lori? Like parents oh. make meat and potatoes yeah. or. We had, you know, chicken cutlets, you know, the usual meat potatoes. Yeah. But, you know, we didn't have any takeout stuff. Like, then, like, you weren't, we didn't have McDonald's. Oh, yeah, yeah. that was we a didn't. real special That's treat a special to get McDonald's. Treat. Pizza yeah. was a exactly. special treat. Yeah. It was maybe on a Friday or a Saturday Pizza night. Pizza was after the divorce. Then we got it when we saw our dad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right? Um, my mom didn't buy soda. She didn't buy any soda. We would drink. It was either iced tea, milk, or water. 
Okay. You know, uh, maybe apple juice, but I never liked apple juice, so I didn't drink it. Um, and you said you had a book. Was there nutrition advice in there, or was that in the book that I had? Yeah. Um, no, this book that I had, no, it didn't give you like. I don't think it gave you advice. I think I might even still have the book at home after. <laughs> It just gave you the breakdown of everything like what we would always do, um, you know, like, uh, let's just say, you know, three ounces of chicken is this, you know, this much fat, this much that this was they even had stuff in there from like McDonald's, a lot of takeout like stuff a Weight Watchers book. Yeah, almost yeah. like, but it broke everything down, told you what, you know, what all the calories, this, that and the other thing were for. But um, yeah, but that's pretty much what my, you know, growing up at home with my, you know, my sisters and my mom. Nice. Basic. Nobody, I, I don't think then you, you. None of my friends had like McDonald's and all of that stuff or any of the, you know, I, fast My kids take food. out way too much because I, I don't have any time and I'm stressed well, and I'm picking them up and I'm driving the other one somewhere right. and work, you know, dominates my life right. even though I don't want it to. So I'm just like, just order DoorDash. You know? But it was also, you know, it was also the time. Like you didn't, like I'm saying, like for my mother, it was divorced, raised three kids. You know, she had two jobs. You know, that fast food, like you say, it was like, you know, a treat for that. Right. You know, and then... You weren't eating so much fresh. I mean, my mother, you know, it was canned vegetables in the can or mm. frozen. I like it wasn't really fresh. The fresh part was maybe lettuce for salad. Okay. You know, so same style for you. Um. Yeah. Well, we had a garden. My dad was very Ooh. into the garden, so he grew a lot of vegetables there and flowers and everything. But my parents were married until I was eleven, almost twelve, okay. and then uh, I don't think anybody kept up with the garden. You know, mm. after my parents got divorced, my parents had a very good divorce. You know, they they remained uh, good friends. Oh, that's you know, good. My mother would come to my dad and my stepmother's for holidays and stuff like oh, that. So nice. yeah, we we just had a, a bigger family really after the divorce. There wasn't any animosity, at least that I saw. Mm. Um. But yeah, so we had fresh vegetables from the garden. We had well water, um, you know, and then just, you know, to getting into why we're here, a lot of people in the neighborhood got cancer, like cancers when they were very young, cancers that didn't make sense. And, you know, the, the land had been farmland treated with deep before we all lived there. So these are dads in the 70s, like, oh, wow, I have well water, I have an organic garden, and that could, and be, that could have been that it. Could have been it. Could have been part of it, you know? Yeah, um, and you know, and it's funny you say that because I'm even saying, like, for me, myself, when I was diagnosed, I was living here half of my life mm -hmm. from Queens to, to yeah. Oceanside. So on my side of the street, like I'm going to say about anywhere between 10 and 20 years before me, there were women that lived on my block that grew up in Oceanside, and they grew up and lived on that. So my next door neighbor, a neighbor on the corner, and another neighbor on the block, all three women, all three breast cancer. Yeah. One across the street also grew up here. Um, breast cancer. Two of them, two of them died. One, she just died recently because she beat the breast cancer, but it went uh, after, I don't know, 10, 12 years or so, it went somewhere else. That's what happened to my mother. It came back. Yeah, it came back and, and it went, her. Yeah. yeah, went all over and, you know, the other one down the block from me, she still kicking, going, whatever, still smokes, still, you know, and I'm sitting here and I'm going, oh my God, I can't believe it. Because she was the one we thought was never going to make it. It's just, it's just crazy. I think it's, you know, it's like a primary and a secondary factor. So primary, you could have a genetic predisposition mm -hmm. for it, but with a secondary environmental factor, that's what really kicks it in. Because I know my brother just sent me a picture of some of our neighbors the other day. He's like, remember this family had the parents just smoked nonstop? He's like, well, they're still alive. And the mother just turned 80. My mother never smoked. She right. never drank. Mm -hmm. She, she was not overweight. She didn't take birth control pills you know and she she got breast cancer for the first time at 43 and then she died of it at 68 it's it's just it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make sense yeah it doesn't make any sense and i even asked my doctor i go do you think that could have anything to do and then we have the dumps over here you know i think it definitely does with my mom because she has an identical twin sister who's fine yeah see and that was the same my mother-in-law she, she didn't live around she didn't she, live in new york yeah. you know they, they lived in dc then in colorado then in Tennessee. and i don't have the yeah. gene did you have the gene we tested negative for the gene but i'm sure they told you the same thing too so i was tested my sister jessica was tested that's my sister with right. my mom and my mom was tested we all tested negative but the geneticist at sloan kettering told me we only know about about 25 percent of the genes that this right. doesn't mean your cancer is oh. not genetic we just right. don't know we just don't know. so it could it could be both it could be genetic and it could be where i grew up and it could be that those two things working together is why mm. it happened Let's get into that. Yeah. We're both survivors. Mm -hmm. We just had our breast cancer event, so we thought this was appropriate to go into. Always a great event. Yeah, always a great yeah. event. Caused me to look up some stuff. I see one in eight women in the U.S. are diagnosed. That it's is, amazing. I thought, a lot less than that. That's a insane. It's insane. Is it on the rise? Is that what it is? I think it said it was on the rise. Because oh. it's now everything in your food. 
Right. Exactly. You know? And other countries don't allow this crap to go into their food. Yeah. Like, exactly. We are not like the best, most advanced nation no. if we're allowing food full of shit to be fed to exactly. all of us, including our kids, you mm-hmm. know? So also one in 833 men. Mm. I knew a guy that had it that I grew up with, this guy, Phil. He was a cop in the city. I, he either is retired or he's about to retire now, but he had breast cancer. He had to have, I guess, some kind of surgery Surgery's to his chest. Fine. I mean, he's alive. You know? Right, right. But, yeah. That's every two minutes a woman in the U.S. is diagnosed. Yeah. Again, that seems it's, it's a like lot. a lot. It's a lot. You could, you, could bang out, if you could bang out five people off the top of your head right now that you know, you know, I mean, that's sad. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that's why, you know, when we have events like this and other places have events like this for breast cancer, like, everybody's affected by it. So everybody mm-hmm. shows up. Everybody either had a mom or a friend yeah. or a friend's mom or a grandmother or themselves or, you know, more and more. If it's one in eight, you know, it's like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon. You're going to just Yeah. It's a mean, close-to-home issue. And yeah. being the Jones Beach Breast Cancer Walk, is, I, 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 I'm amazed at the amount of people that are walking. Cause they, and you see they all have shirts made up, teams made up, whatever, and then all the women that are there that survived – or, you know, I guess maybe men too, but you never see, it's always, you know, my mom, yeah. you know, my grandmother, my aunt, my sister, my, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's sad. You walk in there and then when you leave, like, it's just, I, I don't know. And I leave, I'm like, sometimes I feel like, sometimes I feel guilty in a way because it's yes. like, you know, I, I made it and there's all these others that they're walking for in memory that did not make it. Mm-hmm. I even saw a woman that I knew from Queens that Frank sees all the time from the neighborhood. She was a customer and close with the family, and she came. She's beat it and came back, and she doesn't look good, mm-hmm. you know. And I feel, and she's she's a lot older than I am, but I still I feel I feel bad, you know. And it was just by chance that I saw that we saw her because all of a sudden we hear someone going Frank, Frank, you know. And it was just like, oh my but she's still fighting. She's still fighting, That's and awesome. she still has a great attitude. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. My mom always had such a great attitude. So the first time she was diagnosed with breast cancer, I was 17. And, uh, you know, she just went through absolute hell with it. She had the one breast removed, and then she went through chemotherapy. And, you know, they didn't have the good medication back then. So she was vomiting, and she lost her hair, and she had the mouth sores. And then as soon as she was done with the chemo, it came back Mm -hmm. worse than ever. I'm sorry, they had done a lumpectomy first. Then they went back and removed the breast after the the chemo didn't work. Then she had radiation. And she went through all of this. And then she was cancer-free. Um, for how long? I would say like 20, 25 years, maybe oh, wow. a long, a long time. And then it came back in her, in her bones and they, tre- they treated that successfully for a long time as well. I, I think about like seven years she, she still lived with it in her bones. This is your mother. You said. Yeah. My mother. Um, and then I'm sorry, no, we couldn't have been 25 years. I'm terrible with math. She got it for the first time at 43. She died of it 25 years later at 68. So for for a long period of time, she she was uh, in remission. So you know, I was already probably in my 30s when it when it came back. My mom's cancer when she died when I was 41. Um, so basically, she had been doing like this pill chemo and mm. also a bone strengthener. And uh, so she had been in the hospital. She hadn't been feeling well. They were doing some tests when I was diagnosed in February of 2015. And then I had my mastectomy on March 11th of 2015. And then five days after that, I mean, my mother couldn't even be with me in the hospital. We were all just worried about her. We knew I was detected. Right. My, my was detected early. My mom couldn't be with me in the hospital. She felt bad about that. We just wanted, you know, we were just worried about her. Um, and then five days after that, they found out that her cancer had spread to her liver. And they said, there's really not much else we could do. We could give you this very harsh chemo that'll have terrible side effects mm-hmm. and it'll maybe extend your life a little bit. And she said, you know what? I'm done. Yeah. And, and I don't blame her. And she thought we'd be mad at her for right, not wanting right. to fight anymore. We were like, mom, we don't want you to suffer. No. You know? And then, um, and then like, so then that whole time, those, you know, those next few months before she died, you know, I was going to the chemo oncologist. Great news. You don't need chemo. Mm-hmm. And then to the... Uh, radiation oncologist great news you don't need radiation and then we're setting up hospice for my mom and she's in diapers and she can't get out of bed anymore and she's not gaining consciousness every day and and I've, I've I think I just had like such guilt I just kind of like shut down I couldn't talk about it for the longest time I felt like why couldn't I have had just a little bit more cancer right when I'm yes. young and I could have bought it so she could have had a little bit less it just it doesn't make any sense but that no. was just where I, that's where I was at at the time um you know and then uh my aunt came up to be with her and they had like a liquid morphine they could give her when she was in pain. This is and exactly my, what yeah. my mother in law. And my aunt cared for her until she passed away. She died on June nineteenth of twenty fifteen, and uh, we we were glad her suffering was over. She yeah. she had been a great nana to my kids and Justin's right. kids. She knew my brother's first child was on the way. 
Um, mm-hmm. And she was just a great mom. She always had a positive attitude. She loved us. You know, right, she right. cared that I was going to be okay, and I would be the same way if, God forbid, it was Shannon. You know, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, just a great mom till the end. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So you went to Sloan. Yes, so you. Did I. Yeah, mm-hmm. yes, in the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. Me too. I still have to go back there now for my appointments because I went in the city in the first place. So it's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I have the breast cancer surgeon and the and the uh, Who are your MRI. Doctors? Uh, Dr. Uh, L. Tamer was my breast cancer surgeon. Dr. McCarthy was my plastics. Okay. And Dr. Gajira is my oncologist. Okay. So I, I think when I'm done with the tamoxifen, I don't have to. I finished mine. Oh, nice, nice. Seven yeah. years. All right. right. I was done. Yeah, they, they're making me do ten, so I have one and a half to go. Yeah, and they I, took me off. And I can have grapefruit again. First it went to <laughs> five, then it went to ten. Mm. And now they went down. Last time I went, they were down to seven. Yeah, I'm looking forward to not taking it anymore. Yeah, because I had I just I couldn't take go into Sloan anymore right now because of my health, my insurance, and they don't oh, take my insurance. My house. What is the medicine? Tamoxifen. It's like a it's an estrogen block. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's supposed to because if you were like we were estrogen positive breast cancer, that's yeah. why it blocks the estrogen in your body okay. so that it d- doesn't can't maybe can't spread or can't you know. Come back. Let me so then we could never take any hormones. So like right. I couldn't take birth control pills again. Um, I can't take any hormones for menopause. Like nothing mm-hmm. ever. So I don't know what's going to happen then. But we'll find out. Just go with it. <laughs> yeah. Just go with it. Yeah. All right. What stage were you at? Um, I think stage two. Yeah. yeah. Same. Yeah. So they caught it early. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the difference because my mother ignored it. You know, probably for a long time until it was like coming out of her breast because you didn't in the eighties test yeah, a healthy different. woman in her early forties. You know. Mm. And for me, I was getting preventative tests anyway. The, the tumors were so small when they found them on my routine mammogram and sonogram that they were able to catch it that early. And I think that's the difference is the early detection. Yeah. And, just, yeah. and, and, and they didn't do a lumpectomy or remove one breast. They removed both, both. breasts. I had a total bilateral mastectomy. I, I didn't had a choice. Do anything else. Yeah, oh, they said they could have left the one. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hell no. So I can do this again in two years? Take right. it well, Yeah. I was always going for, when I was in my 30s after I had Taylor, um, I had gone to the doctor because I was, and I had like a pain in the left breast. Oh, and I always thought, oh, I must have pulled it working out because mm-hmm. I was always, you know, how much it does some. So they went, I had to do the sano and the mammo. And I was just calcification, they used to call it, or, you yeah, know, because yeah. I had dense breast. They yeah, they say fibrocystic, right, fibrocystic dense breast. Fibrocystic dense breast, breast this, yeah. that, the other thing. I always went. So from then on, I went every year, you know, and went and went. And then I want to say it was 20. I have it. It was 2014. So it was about 2013. It was like December 2013. Went for my usual mammo and sano. The doctor says, the radi- radiologist says to me, Oh, I see, you know, something on your right breast. You need to have um, um, a biopsy. And I was like, Okay, give me, give me, I don't like needles. Give me my stuff. I'll give it to my breast doctor and he'll check it or whatever. What's your like thought process right there? Do you just think, Of course, not me? I just thought right then and there, I'm cystic. They always tell me I'm cystic. It'll be fine. I'll send him, you know, my breast doctor, the, you know, that, and then he'll tell me what to do. He took it, said, go for a six month recheck. Okay, great. So I went for the six month recheck and did the both mammo sano on both and then had to go for a recheck again. And then it was June of 2014. And the radiologist comes down and says, you know, I know I'm not supposed to do another mammo on, on your left. It's only supposed to be the right. He goes, but I want to do another one on the left. I see something. I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, fine. He goes, we do the thing. And he goes, I'll be around if you're sitting down. As soon as I'm sitting down out there, I go, I know what it is. I know it. I'm, I'm, this is it. So he comes out, tells me all this, blah, 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 for the right. Meanwhile, they thought it was going to be the right. I had it in the left. Wow. Thank God they checked both. Yep. Yeah. Thank God for this rate. So then again. Did you have he, any pain on that side? I had a little bit of pain on the side in the same spot that I did when I had the tail when I went for the first time almost 10 years before. Wow. That's and crazy. And then he says to me, okay, he goes, we're going to do a biopsy of these. And this. I go, oh, just give my stuff to, to the breast doctor because I didn't want to have needles done. He goes, listen, Lori, I've been friends with Dr. DeRisi for 20 years. He goes, if I say you have to have this biopsy, he's going to agree with me. So I'm not telling him any of this. Like he was like stern. So I was like, okay, fine. Went he back knew, in. He, he knew. knew. He yeah. Those two, I had to go in two different days and he went in, I had all the surgeons in there, you know, the nurses in there, they did it. It was a Friday. I had to wait the whole weekend till Monday. I remember Monday morning, he calls me up and he says, Lori, he says, I have some news. This is the radiologist, not even the breast doctor. Okay. And I said, okay. 
he's like, he calls and he tells me and he tells me that they found it. And right then and there, I, I could just tell my face just turned sheer white, right? I almost wanted to drop the phone. I was babysitting. The kids were running around, you know, it was in the morning and whatever. And I'm How like, old are you here? I was 45, 45 then. Yeah. So I said, all right. I said, um, what do I do? I said, what do I do? What do I do? And I was like, listen, I said, I can get into Sloan. I said, would I go to Sloan or should I go back to Dr. DeRisi? He goes, listen, Laura, he goes, Sloan is in our backyard. He goes, if you can get in there, he goes, I would go. I said, okay. And then that's what I did. And then, you know. Yeah, they're, they're great there. And and they yeah. are great. So what it was, it was. They get everything first there, all the information. My sister-in-law. Yeah. yeah. My sister-in-law, who, the noble. Yeah. yeah. So her grandma, his, her husband's grandmother, when she had, she had cancer and went right into Sloan and she took care of everything. He opened up a foundation under her name at Sloan. Okay, wow. So I just called, she called, they called in, they called right in. I was in three days later, I was in there. I didn't even have to redo all my tests. I sent, I got everything from everywhere, I sent it in, you know, this, that, saw the doctor, they told us what we could do. And um, she's like, we, we're gonna definitely do the, the left. She goes, the right, we could just remove. This ended up just being, they called it, um, a sclerosing lesion hmm. and, I, and it was a mess like when she showed it to me it was a hot mess so I was like nope I'm yeah. just gonna get rid yeah. of this my body I'm gonna just, yeah <laughs> I'm gonna just take them off I'm gonna call it a day mm -hmm. that's exactly what so I'm from saying. phone call to operation so phone call to operation days. then I had a I had to wait a while because they put the in the um, expanders in to because I was doing you know I didn't get my my implants put in right away did yeah, I had the expanders put in with yeah. the mastectomy, and then they, and then after healing of six weeks, I would go back every week, and, and they, they would inject them. more, and it's yep. like going and through puberty a second time, <laughs> yeah. and then they did a second surgery to swap them out, and yep. then I had to do it again after I had just started this job, where I didn't, you know, not that it was a big deal to tell anybody there, not right, that I would right. have had to tell them why, but I, I was working there like six months, and I got this letter like, oh, your implants may cause lymphoma, and, oh, for, you know, no. and are killing okay. people all over the world, so I ended up having to get the implants taken Take out in September of 2019 oh. and new ones put in and then now I have to get an MRI of them in January I guess because they like keep an eye on them or something but I mean they're on top of everything at Sloan. Do yeah. they like having that surgery again with the drains? No. No. The no. drains are the, oh, the drains are the worst. You can't take a shower. I'm, I'm an obsessive shower. Oh, I shower before shower? the gym. Oh they told me I couldn't shower oh, with yeah, the drains. I showered. Mm, so that would have made it a lot less stressful mm -hmm. for me. I showered. Yeah. No, I shower before the gym, I shower after the gym, I shower at night. It's like to not shower for a week uh, three different times for me for those surgeries right, right. skeeved me to death. Yeah. yeah. I had to have my friend come over to wash my hair because oh, I couldn't yeah. like, raise my it was, hair. Yeah. <laughs> it was weird. I know. It was every time going back every couple of weeks for them to yeah. load up, load up, load up. And then because... they don't stay anywhere near that No, size. because they yes. tell you you lose 20% yeah, exactly. as soon yeah. as they take it out and you lose 20%. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I mean, <laughs> there was some parts that were funny. Like I remember sitting in the – do you remember sitting like in the – and waiting to get called in and they make you walk in yeah. to get the surgery yeah. for the um you're holding the, the gown operation you're holding the gown and you're walking in and everybody's walking in with you and you, and you literally come in and you're laying on something like this yeah this is what you're laying on and then yeah. they put the hot blankets the hot bubble yes, blankets on they you, knock you out. they knock you out and yeah. i get in there i'll never forget again i go sit down and i go this fucking sucks you know and then, you know, the next thing you know, they're like, okay, count from 100 back. And you're like, 100, boom. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I got, like, two numbers done with that. And then it's just like, yeah, that part was great because, you know, and then whatever painkillers they were giving you intravenously in the beginning. And then after that wore off, then it was just like, oh, Yeah, I, I, yeah. I didn't take those for very long. I took them for, like, four days, and that was it. I threw them out. I didn't take them anymore. No, because... I, kept, I kept taking them because I, I was, like, trying to drive the kids around and stuff like that. And I was oh, just yeah. having so much pain. Uh, just any time I leaned forward at all. <laughs> Just, and, and then there was that while where it kind of felt like you were wearing like uh, uh, an underwire bra made of razor blades yeah. underneath your skin. Yeah. So I just had to keep taking the pain. Yeah. I, I, I found it distracting I to be in that much pain. pain. I didn't yeah. have that much oh, good. pain. I don't know why, but I didn't. I didn't have that much pain. I did with so the first and the third surgery. Deal. The second one, I was fine. That was Yeah. Like when they did the swap yeah. out, I was fine. I yeah. didn't have to. I expected it to be the same thing as the yeah. vasectomy, so I was pleasantly surprised. But then I expected the third surgery to be as easy to recover from as the second one, and it was not because they had to remove a whole bunch of the surrounding tissue uh -huh. around the defective implants to test it to see if there were any cancer cells, which there were not, thankfully. Right. But yeah, so then, so hopefully never again. But you know, I, I guess I have to get the MRI every five years. So I will reach a I point in my life where I'll say, just get, take them out and don't put any more in. I don't happens. get anything yeah. done. Like, I don't have to do MRIs. I don't do anything. They didn't tell me how to do anything. 
I thought I didn't have to go back to the plastic surgeon after they did the first nipple tattoos, and then apparently that was wrong, and I wouldn't have known that unless I got the letter saying that the implants were being recalled, and they were like, you still have to come every year and get an MRI every five years, and I was like, all right, well, nobody told me that. I just literally walked out of the plastic surgeon's office um, after the first nipple thing, right. and I just thought I would never go back. And if the implants hadn't have been recalled, I wouldn't have. So. You did your tattoos there too? Yeah, I did. I, I did, did them originally before the um, before the swap, and then they had like a, a better one. They said after the swap, so they they, they had them I do didn't it again. Do it there. Yeah. Oh, I you did it at a regular tattoo artist. I went to. Um, did you ever hear of him, Vinny Myers? The guy in Baltimore. Yep. Yeah, they told me to go there. But I know because <laughs> I went there when I went. And you like it? I told them yeah. about it when I was going. I told my doctors about it, and I told them, and they were like, "Really? Yeah." So yeah, I went. Somebody I, at Sloan Kettering told me told to go me, there. Yeah, yeah, because you know what? That's what it is. They said yeah. that they. Um, my son found them when I was going through it. He found them. Was telling them the surgeon there because they told us at that time, "Don't get it done there." Okay. Yeah. At Sloan. Oh, yeah, so no, they, they, told, they told me that too, and I was just like, I don't have time to go to Baltimore, you yeah. know, so I mean, I do have cousins there that we visit sometimes, um, and then they said they had a better way of doing it at Sloan when I got the second one. I mean, they're fine. It's just, I don't know if it'd be better at the Baltimore place or not, but yeah. So, <laughs> yeah I, at that time, like I said, they said, don't come here and get, don't come yeah. to here because they weren't professional, like really, you know. Yeah, no, they told they, me that they, too. They, he does them like 3D. They really look like, oh, wow. yeah, right. they almost really look weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. So. so yours was discovered in routine? Test? Yeah, so I had a mammogram and a sonogram, I guess it was like in January of 2015, and then I remember they called me, it was the day after um, the polar bear plunge, okay. <laughs> they, called, they called me on the way to work and they said, you know, we want you to come back for some more views, and I was like, oh, well, I don't know if I have time this week, they were like, no, right away, you know, and I was like, okay, okay, in that case I can be there tomorrow, and then um, they scheduled me for the biopsies the following week, so I had the biopsy on the right breast on a Monday, and then I was... Um, I went back Wednesday to have the one on the, the left, no, Thursday to have the one on the left breast, but they called me, I think it was the Wednesday night, and they said that it was positive. So I already knew that I had breast cancer in the right breast before I went back for the biopsy for the left one, which was just like a cyst or something. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and a then, bit like reversed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so weird, right? So then I had to just get, get all the, the films and stuff uh, from from NRAD and from my, my doctor and send it to mm-hmm. Sloan. And then I Which is good because normally there. they make you redo all of it because they want their own testing done. Yeah, they, I think they did do an MRI mm. um, when I, I went in there. Like it was still February and I went there and then the mastectomy was March 11th. So I found out that I had breast cancer on February 11th and the mastectomy was March 11th. Mm. I found out in the beginning of June, like June 3rd, 4th, and then I was done July 12th. Okay. 12th. Yeah. 12th, so it's not 14th. bad, about a month. And it, they said that the cancer cells had gone like right up to the edge of what they removed. In fact, I even went back five weeks after the mastectomy and they removed more tissue from under my armpit to make sure it hadn't spread. So I'm like, it's good we didn't wait any longer then. Yeah. To, you know. Mine was in the milk duct. Oh my God. Yeah. I think my, I think mine was ducted as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that my cousin, um, not not a blood relative cousin, my uh, my stepmother's um, stepbrother's daughter, she had it so much worse than I did. She was younger than me, and her doctor wouldn't believe her. She was breastfeeding her baby, and she said, something's wrong, something's wrong, and she insisted. And hers had already spread all through the lymphatic system, and she had to have chemo. She's fine now, thank God. Thank God. But, I mean, the big difference uh, for me, you know, they said, we're going to take the sentinel node and mm-hmm. test it. Like, Same. Right then and there. They did and so, right there. Yeah, and so <clears throat> I asked my dad, to be standing next to the bed when I woke up and tell me if the if the lymph node tested positive or not. And he was there, and he said it was negative, and mm-hmm. then that was why I didn't have to have chemo and radiation. I mean, they still wow. went through more testing than maybe right. the oncologist, Same. but that was a huge, huge part that it hadn't spread into the lymphatic system. True. Yeah, because then that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was much more scared of having chemotherapy than I was of having any of the surgeries. Because, I mean, you hear about people, it gets into your muscles and your joints, and you're yep. just never the same. You can't work out anymore. Like, for me, the big thing was, got to get back to CrossFit. You know? <laughs> got to get back to running. And I was doing yeah, obstacle running. racing at the time. Yeah, yeah I was running. a big runner then, too, at that yeah. point. And then, I st- then we started to train. We trained for, uh, I got into the marathon, the New York City Marathon. Nice. So we did it 2015. That same year? Oh, nice. 2015, I did awesome. it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Does it affect you training today at all? Yeah. Really, yeah. I don't, it's sometimes just like so. a pulling feeling. I was going to say, sometimes something. it's yeah. a pulling, but it's, it's not nothing. even just not just when I'm working out, though. It's just like, I, I feel like I'm more impacted in that area by, like, my shoulders than I am by this, the surgery. Like, if I can't do a push-up or something, it's because I'm having pain here, yeah. not here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Did you, I, were you numb for a long time? Like, my back was numb for a really oh, long wow, time. Oh, wow, no, I don't think so. Oh, my back was numb for a long time. Like, I remember I went to the dermatologist to have something removed off my back, and they were like, okay, Lori, um, 
I was laying there, and then I said to him, "Okay, are you gonna, rem- you know, are you gonna take it off?" They're like, "We already did." Oh wow! I had no feel. I said, "I don't have any feeling in my back," because I, I, you know, and I told the doctors when I went, and they yeah. said it was just it was normal from everything that they take out. Yeah. You know, it messes with the nerve it messes endings with probably, everything, yeah. the nerve endings and all that. Yeah, it's so weird. Wild stories. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's just crazy. I mean, I'm like remembering crazy. some of the stuff I haven't thought yeah. about. That's what makes it sad. Yeah, yeah and I'm thinking about, about the same like, thing, yeah. and I was like, you know, I remember them when he, like I said, when he told me, and I like crying 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 and then all of a sudden out of nowhere like i had like this calming come over me like that everything was going to be fine like it was the weirdest yeah. weirdest thing i ever felt in you know like it's going to be fine and then that was it i never i never cried i never got upset nothing ever since since then i was just like i'm fine i'll be good nice yeah. i don't know it's weird I that way after a right? couple of days too like weird. first of all i'd seen my mother have like a strong positive attitude about it when she had had it when i was a teenager and then like the first couple of days after i found out i just kind of felt like anxious restless i couldn't sleep i kept going to my mm-hmm. kids rooms and like hugging them and then uh, i just thought you know it would be worse than this if one of them had cancer right and then i and then i was able to be okay to be i was okay. like okay it's me you know it's right. like it's not my children so right. that that's what got me over that initial hurdle for whatever the reason that's what popped yeah. into my head so Morbid thoughts, <laughs> right? It is. It's it's just it is. It's kind of weird. I think if you that. didn't have kids when you were diagnosed, would you still be able to find that strength, or is that really what just got you through? You know, I think it's. Uh, I, I mean, I think I, I would have gotten through anyway for the rest of my family. It's just, right. you know, like I had friends that I grew up with that had this happen before they had kids that wanted to have kids and then couldn't. So I think that that wow. was probably that's. What I was just going to say the yeah, same exactly. thing. Exactly. I think that would have been so. Like worse. my my friend's uh, sister had ovarian cancer in her twenties, and, and unfortunately, she actually also passed away in her twenties. And then another girl in my neighborhood, her sister had breast cancer and died in her twenties. And then um, this girl, the one that was my age, she got it at thirty two. And she hadn't had kids yet, and she, um, they had the BRCA gene, her family. So she had a mastectomy and a hysterectomy. So I think that it was a lot harder um, for her, but first of all, because she lost her sister, of course. Mm. And then second of all, because she lost her fertility when she still wanted it. I knew that I was done having kids right. at that point. Same. So even if, I, you know, even if right. I had lost my fertility as a result of the treatment, it wasn't something I needed anymore. Mm-hmm. You know? Same thing. That's going to make a big difference for women yeah. that go through it young. Yeah. 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 Wow. yeah. It's, if you, you find out that you have it, you have to get your eggs. Right. Take your eggs and yeah. freeze them because once you go through all this, you can't, you won't be able to have any kids. Okay. Right. If you go through, if you go through chemotherapy, then mm-hmm. it just like shocks you into mm-hmm. menopause. That's what happened to my mom. Okay. Um, but I, you know, like I said, I didn't have chemotherapy, so mm. it wouldn't have been the same for me. But you know. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the beauty of facilities like this is we one big community. Mm-hmm. So probably a lot of younger ladies in there that look up to the the older ladies for their who you calling old well, older. <laughs> <laughs> older than them i mean not old of course but they call you the grandma with the six pack right? I, I always call myself the elderly one so it's yeah that's right well, any words to them any advice just get, the get tested. Just get tested. Yeah. Just yeah. go get those boobies squeezed. And if something feels wrong, <laughs> don't take no for an answer That's from right. your doctor. I mean, that you probably know saved my body. cousin's life. Yeah, exactly. You know, get a mammogram, get a sonogram. If you have family history, speak up. So, like, as mm-hmm. far as with the health insurance companies, my, you know, my sister and I were both going every year for mammograms and sonograms. So now my sister is older than my mom and I both were when we were diagnosed. But once I was diagnosed, my sister can now get mammograms and sonograms mm-hmm. twice a year and she can get a breast MRI. Yep. So if it's in your family and you communicate with your insurance company and your doctors, then you yep. can have more preventive and testing. Because I think the key is just catching it early it's and removing everything. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you, if you're gonna, remove the source. Right. It's not an arm or a leg. You no. don't need it. You right. Know, it's just, right. Yeah. Except, like you say, if they're younger and right. they well, want to have children, if you want to have kids, then it's got to be heartbreak. I mean, yeah. I breastfed my kids for years and I loved it. I would have been sad if I wouldn't have been able to do that. Yeah. But even worse if I couldn't have had them in the first place. Right, you know? right, right. Even the same with my girls. My girls could have started to go, my two girls, at any time to go get, you know, mammograms, sonograms because of me. Yeah, I started getting it when I was 28. Mm-hmm. I had a biopsy when I was 28. It was nothing. You know, yeah. But, uh, but I still started, then I started getting mammograms after that. And then there was a several year period that I didn't have mammograms or sonograms because I was pregnant with Michael. Then I was still breastfeeding Michael when I got pregnant with Shannon. Then I was breastfeeding Shannon. Then they said the milk has to be totally gone for six months or you could get a false positive. So I waited like another year to make sure, um, you know, and then I guess it was still probably another, it was really maybe another five years after that, actually, mm. when I got breast cancer. So it wasn't that long. Think right, that isn't. The grand scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Wow. No, that's all I could say is just, you know, go get, yeah. do, you, do your mammo and your sano. 
and and ask for a sonogram because yeah. mammals don't always pick fine. it up. Mammals found sonograms, on the sonogram. Yep. Yeah, they, sonograms. Yeah, sonograms pick up more, they, they which they I don't understand why they, they don't just right. It's do the significantly sonogram. less painful. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So that's the only thing I could do yeah. as far as you eating. I mean, you eat as healthy as you can eat. Yeah. You know, if you know that you're sitting there eating, you know, processed food all the time, then right. I'm not saying that's going to happen to you, but just in the general, it could be a contributing things, factor. It, it, yeah. Definitely. Or you could eat nothing but organic vegetables, and it's, you it's still get still it. Get it. You know, exactly. Just, yeah. There's, uh, there's factors. There's that they no don't rhyme or reason, yeah. honestly. It's uh, it's a horrible thing to say. It's almost like it's like luck of the draw. Yeah. Uh, it really is. Yeah. No, and, the, and the key is to test early. So my my husband's mother had breast cancer in her forties as well, and she died in her forties. So my daughter yeah. has two grandmothers and a mother that have breast cancer in their forties, going into her genetic pool. Yeah, you know? so she'll hopefully start getting mammograms as young as she can. Yeah. I mean, she's only fifteen now, so yeah, <laughs> she, right. she would freak out if I suggested it. But Bro, you know, yeah, forget it. Such a mother. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Passing over 40 minutes. Oh. This was awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sitting down. I know. It's like, I feel like we have so show. much in yeah, common. Of, yeah, you know, we deal with that today. It's like, yeah. Pre, pre-breast cancer. Mm. Like, you know, the, the places that we've crossed probably, you know. Mm. Yeah. It's so crazy. But I don't know. I don't know. It's in so many different clusters in Long Island. Yeah, and in Rockland. Rock Rock I was just going to say, in Rockland. It's, it's not even just breast cancer, though. So I had a neighbor it's, that died of lung cancer that had never smoked. Um, and then her daughter, who was my sister's age, died of brain cancer at 39, you know. And then, like I said, you know, my friends Kate and Doris, who both lost their sisters, and they mm -hmm. also had cancer themselves. And uh, I think Kate's mother had it. Doris' yeah. mother had it. She's still alive. Like, there's so many people yep. in my neighborhood. My girlfriend know? who lives up in Rockland, too, she, she's in, um, I forget where she is, whatever, in Rockland. But I grew up anyway. in West Nyack. Well, I don't know why. It just flew right out of my head where she's, it'll come back. Um, her daughter, I Thirteen was diagnosed with leukemia. Oh my god! I mean, she's okay now, but thank we god. talk about the eggs. You said she thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. They yeah. had her. They correct. They actually literally. You can Jeez. cut this part out, but they, if you want, but they had to force her period on. Oh my god! Just so they could. So they could extract. The yep. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because she had. Um, thank God, her oldest son was a perfect match for bone marrow. Perfect match. So they, you know. They take out everything from you. You have no immune system. They did the transfer, and thank God, knock on wood, she's she's good. That's incredible. Yeah, and she's she's 25, same age as Taylor. Oh wow. Yep. It's crazy. So she never had her period. She's already already in menopause. No, from she's egg freezing. Or no, just, I think she just would have damaged the egg. She's oh, okay. she's fertile. Okay. She, I mean, she's um infertile. I mean, she can't have any. She can't be okay. because of the. But, but the, she has um, the eggs waiting. She has the eggs. She has okay. like 18 eggs. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Took out like it's amazing minutes. what they can do. It's it amazing, is. is right what they can do. Yeah, so, but it's true. It's in so many clusters. Mm -hmm. Once again, ladies, mm -hmm. thanks for going into something so personal, and I hope we can educate yeah. somebody. Do you remember what was going on at the gym? <laughs> you could shut that off. <laughs> What's the gossip? When we were at Jetty? Oh my God! <laughs> no, I, I missed that. <laughs>